So my name is Samuel Seppan and I'm an associate professor here um, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, thank you so much organizers for having me chair this panel. Um, really has been an interesting afternoon for me. So we have now four speakers um, in this panel. So why don't I uh, introduce the speakers first? First, we have Professor Harpreet Kaur. Uh, now, she's a professor of law at the National Law University in Delhi, where she's been teaching corporate law, securities regulations, business law, and competition law. Um, she specializes in commercial law in her research. Then we have uh, Professor Tang Hang Wu. Um, he's a professor and director of the Center for Cross-Border Commercial Law in Asia um, at the Singapore Management University School of Law. Now his research covers land law restitution, equity, trusts, charity, and non-profit law. Third, we have our own uh, Mr. Arthur Lee. Uh, he's a professional consultant here at the CUHK Faculty of Law. Uh, he joins us after 10 years of practice in chancery and commercial law. And then finally, um, we have Ms. Lin Chi Unga. Um, she's a postgraduate student um, at the Faculty of Law um, at the University of Macau, uh, where she also serves as a teaching fellow uh, for obligations law and tax law. So um, each speaker has 20 minutes uh, time to present. Um, again, we have scheduled some time for Q&A after the presentation. So, so please members of the audience, who are now 133, uh, please send me questions using that chat function um, on Zoom. Okay, so if that all is agreeable, um, may I turn this over for, over to uh, Professor Carl, please. Thank you so much, Sam. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jones first for inviting me uh, for this panel. And, and I'm, I'm also thankful to him because he had entertained all my emails that I have been writing to him to understand what he is expect what he is expecting me to present in this panel and i'm also thankful to the wonderful presentations made by professor martinek and gallagher professor gallagher because they have cleared a lot of clouds that i had in my mind uh, when i was working on this presentation and i'm sure that while working uh, completing my paper they will have definitely an influence on my uh, writing so i'm trying to share my screen with you uh, I hope that it is uh, visible to all of you. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the structure of my presentation is um, uh, that uh, first of all, I would take up uh, uh, the legal position, uh, the legal framework in India. Then uh, I'll discuss the first law commission's report. And I'll take two or three important cases to uh, indicate that what is the present situation about unjust enrichment in India. And then finally, I would conclude, but my conclusions are uh, preliminary conclusions only. Uh, if I look at the legal framework of unjust enrichment in India, uh, being a common law jurisdiction, definitely we are influenced still by the common law, uh, but we have taken a special position when it comes to uh, unjust enrichment and uh, the relations which are resembling contracts so we have a chapter five in the Indian Contract Act of 1872, which contains certain regulations resembling those created by contract. And the resembling here, the term express, expresses that the rights, duties, or the liabilities which are arising from these uh, relations are not strictly contractual and they may arise independently of the contracts also. And the resemblance between quasi contracts the term which is used in common law and the genuine contracts may be in form and not in the substance. And we do not use generally the term quasi contracts, but some of the courts they have used in their judgments as well. Now, this chapter has uh, five sections from 68 to 72. And since the statutory authorization has been given to the courts in form of these sections, they can allow any relief uh, by uh, on the basis of theoretical considerations, considering the quasi contracts. Uh, and in their interpretation, they are allowed to have the widest choice uh, for interpreting the terms like unjust benefit, etc. They can give any adequate relief under these provisions. And principles of equity can be extended, can be used in extending the field of the statutory provision in order to meet the circumstances of any particular case. And it is also said that the courts can have uh, the valuable guidance from the English cases, but only in those circumstances when there is ambiguity 
and uh, the, the, the provisions are not clear. Uh, if you look into these uh, five sections, section 68 is about claim for necessaries, uh, section 69 is for reimbursement of person paying money due by another in payment of which he is interested. Section 70 is about obligation of persons enjoying benefits of non gratuitous acts. Section 71 is about responsibility of finder of goods. And 72 is about mistake or coercion. Now, section 70 and 72 are the important sections where we have an interface with the unjust enrichment doctrine. And this is also an important position here to understand that, that this list is not exhaustive. When it was prepared, it was said that it is not exhaustive. It can be suitably extended on principles of equity and provide relief in those cases which have not been considered or which cannot be put under these uh, sections in case there is a special relationship between the parties analogous to contract. There is a resultant duty to make restitution or to pay compensation. And there is some underlying aim of making restitution for a benefit which is unjustly received. Now, let us look at uh, section 70. Why I have taken this section 70? Because we have a lot of case law where unjust enrichment has been discussed under this section. There is one group which says that section 70 is a new section because English law does not have any uh, similar section. Whereas some, some authors, some judges, they have written that this section is the remedies are provided on the basis of quantum error. So this section says that um, this is an obligation of person who is enjoying benefit of a non gratuitous act. So he has to, if he is enjoying the benefit, he has to compensate the former. And if he has enjoyed any, anything which has been delivered to him, he has to restore the thing back to the person who has given it to him. And this section is based on the doctrine of restitution. And it says that um, the restitution is not primarily based on the loss which is suffered by the plaintiff, but which is enjoyed uh, but the gain which is enjoyed by the defendant at the cost of the plaintiff and um, which is uh, which which is required by the uh, which is not required by the defendant to retain uh, there is one uh, early case where we found uh, uh, where we found a lot of importance given to unjust enrichment was the case of mulamchand versus state of uh, mp and this is 1968 indian supreme court case and where the court had referred to the, uh, the to the observation of Lord Wright in Fibrosa's case and said that that these this is the kind of obligation under section 70 which is not founded upon any contract or a tort but it is a third category of law which we call you know quasi contract or restitution the court also referred to the judgment of Lord Denning uh, in Nelson versus Lahore and it said that the right here is not peculiar to equity or contract or tort, but it falls under an important category of cases uh, where the court has to uh, do the restitution. Uh, there was another case, 1962 case, in which section 60, 70 was said to be that it is applicable not only to individuals, but also to corporations and government. However, in this particular case, uh, the defendant's unjust enrichment, whether it was unjust or not, there was no description given by the, by the court. Similarly, in a very early case of uh, 1915, which is Rediar versus Secretary of State for India, uh, uh, there were, uh, the, the judge was of the opinion that the judgments which have been given under Section 70, they have, you know, uh, they have substantial difference of opinion because the wordings of Section are uh, very wide. Now, if I take that position from 1960s and 15 to the present position, I have seen that this section has been used by courts in almost all types of situation, all types of analogous uh, contractual situations like construction, employer-employee relations, proposed marriage um, uh, case, or payment of money, or payment of interest, recovery of interest, etc. And in some of the cases, the courts have referred to the principle of unjust enrichment. Now, how this has been referred, I'll uh, come to this a uh, little later. Now, coming to the second part of my presentation, that how it was dealt by the Law Commission. So the first Law Commission um, had uh, taken up this task of looking into Chapter 5, and, uh, and they presented their report in 1958, and they said that 
we would like to retain the title of this chapter because it is more comprehensive and descriptive rather than the expressions quasi contracts or contracts implied in law or constructive contracts and in the opinion of the law commission that act has not adequately dealt with these uh, types of uh, uh, relations which are resembling those created by contract and the commission also referred to the opinion of lord uh, right where in one of his essays he wrote that indian contract act had dealt with this in a very unsatisfactory manner and the basis of such relations is the principle of unjust enrichment or as professor winfield has said that it is unjust benefit the report also mentioned the opinion of professor williams that this this branch of law in england is rather defective and whereas um, the commission also wrote that uh, in his its report that the american restatement of law has taken up the uh, law of restitution in a uh, in a better opinion now the opinion of uh, the the commission was that 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 there are many still cases which are not provided for, for by the indian act and such cases will have to be dealt on the principles of justice equity and good conscience and if they have to be this expression has to be interpreted not on the basis of narrower sense which is taken under the rules of english law but it has to be given the the widest possible meaning and the recommendation of the the commission was that that there should be an addition of a new section a separate residuary section which could deal with the well known cases of unjust enrichment and they said that there should be one section as i told you restitution by persons unjustly benefited in cases which are not expressly provided for however the recommendation of the commission was not accepted and after that first commission there has been no discussion on uh, this chapter by any of the commissions later on and uh, coming to some of the landmark cases uh, 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 what i have seen is that that the courts when they were in the early phases like 1960s and 70s they had lot of discussion on the unjust enrichment but later on they they were like as a, as a routine matter referring to the unjust enrichment but they were not using it in the proper sense there was one case mafatlal industries versus union of india in 1997 where again this was dealt in the case of uh, for the refund of unlawfully recovered uh, taxes and there was an amendment which was made on the basis of unjust enrichment which is said by the court itself in the in its judgment it was a nine bench um, uh, a nine judge bench which had decided this case because it had lot it was first of its kind which was dealing with the constitutional matter on taxes for a refund of unlawfully recovered um, taxes and the court was of the opinion that right to refund does not flow automatically as an absolute right uh, from the constitution of india under article 265 which deals with the taxes and articles and section 72 which deals with the mistake and in the indian contract act and this provision cannot be this right cannot be diluted or affected by any uh, such equitable plea as unjust enrichment or uh, passing on Uh, and they said that um, the judicial thesis should rest on the principle of economic and distributive justice on the basis of um, the preamble and the directive principles of uh, state policy uh, what they also said that the law of restitution is not intended to provide windfalls to plaintiffs who have suffered no loss and they also said that section 672 is a rule of equity and it is a principle of equity that he who suffers no loss deserves no gain and supreme court for the first first time in this tax matter decided recognize the existence of principle of unjust enrichment and it said that it is part and parcel of the indian and indian legal and constitutional jurisprudence they hold any uh, new or old statute which may uh, have also been enacted to bring the principle under under its statutory cover and it said that bar of unjust unjust enrichment is not confined in its operations only to tax refunds but it is operative also on other money claims um, against the state and it should apply to every and each type of remedy each form of remedy that a person may adopt under the law 
Uh, coming to a, a rel relatively recent uh, case of 2011, now this is a case relating to environment law, and the name of the case is Indian Council for Enviro Legal Action versus Union of India. Now, in this case, there was a chemical industry, a group of chemical industry, one group, which was ordered to pay around 370 million to a village for the cleaning the chemical pollution which it had created, the industry had created, but for 15 years, and it was decided in 1996, the order was given to pay in 1996, but till 2011 for 15 years, they had not paid this amount and on one or the other protect by filing interlocutory application. And the Supreme Court used the principle of unjust enrichment in awarding compound interest over the amount which was unpaid for 15 years. And now if you look into the, 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 the judgment, I have taken certain observations of, from the judgment itself that they have mentioned all the important leading uh, pronouncements uh, relating to unjust enrichment. For example, in the case of Shock versus Nash, uh, where, where it was said that unjust enrichment is the unjust retention of a benefit to the loss of another or retention of a property of another against the fundamental principle of justice, equity, or good conscience. They also said that unjust uh, just enrichment occurs uh, when uh, the defendant wrongfully uh, secures a benefit. And they said that all these principles, they have been used in India. And they, they, the unique uh, proposition which they said that unjust enrichment and restitution are like two shades of green. One is leaning towards yellow and other is leaning towards blue. And whichever, which level is, label is appropriate, it will be decided on the basis of circumstances of the particular case. And they also said that unjust enrichment in such case should be looked into pre-suit state and the post-suit state. And the post-suit state the need for the restitution in relation to court proceedings, it depends upon the, has the jurisdiction, the jurisdiction lies with the court and court can pass appropriate orders that levelize. And they also mentioned the case of Sempra Metals uh, in this particular case. Now, uh, this is a case where the, the unjust enrichment has been on the basis of case of Sempra, which was where I have written that this was a case where the the, uh, we said that the government was had collected uh, you know, undue taxes on the basis of which it did not have to borrow money and that is why it saved on the interest. Now, this is a strong uh, thing which the court has taken into consideration. I have given my opinion here on the basis of you know, what I think that how uh, the position has prevailed so far. And I have also been able to find this prudential uh, assurance case where they have said that Sempra case Sempra Metals case cannot be used for the purpose of compound interest. And also in this particular case, it was not a case which could be put under section 70 or under section 72. Uh, similarly, in another case, also the case uh, of fibrosa was uh, mentioned, whereas there was no discussion on how there has been unjust enrichment, whether there was a failure of consideration or whether there was a mistake nothing was discussed by the court only the simply the statements of the case were repeated and on the basis of this the judgment was given uh, the the case of environment law has also been followed in similarly in the same pattern in 2015 now what is my conclusion conclusion is that that after chapter 50 we have after the chapter 5 was inserted and law commission came up with this report there was no attempt which was made to understand the provisions of chapter 5 on the basis of doctrine of unjust enrichment. Should the common law of restitution for unjust enrichment con uh, continue to apply in Indian uh, jurisdiction uh, beyond the section 68 to 72? We need to have a more uh, you know, discussion and it should not be that whenever the court finds that there has been a receipt of enrichment without going into the unjust factors, the court uh, takes its own decision. We need more research into it. Thank you so much. This is from my side. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Carr, for that overview of, of the law of unjust enrichment.